Jujutsu Kaisen Chapter 255 has just hit stands and online shelves, and what can we say? This might be the issue in which we finally get some of that much-awaited payoff from the previous installments. Now, if you guys have been following our channel, you might be aware that our opinions about the last three chapters of Akutami Sensei's all-time best-selling shonen manga series have been less than stellar, and we can attribute that to how JJK's plot seemingly stalled up until now. So much so, that it almost looked like our favorite Jujutsu sorcerers, and perhaps even Akutami himself, were just throwing bodies at Tsukuna and waiting to see what sticks. But if Chapter 255 is any indication, this could very well be the beginning of something truly epic. Keep your eyes peeled, dear viewers, as we tell you all about what's going on in Jujutsu Kaisen's ongoing Shinjuku showdown arc, and what its story might hold for us fans in the future. Of course, there's going to be full spoilers ahead for the aforementioned chapter of Akutami's seminal manga series. You've been warned, folks. Now let's get to it. What you can expect from Jujutsu Kaisen Chapter 255 The last two installments of Jujutsu Kaisen leading to Chapter 255 was, by all accounts, a love letter to Kusakabe, one of the series' more low-key characters, where we found out that the man's an absolute legend within sorcerer society. Without going too much into detail about the sword-wielding, trench-coat-clad dude, let's just say that he's generally accepted to be the top grade 1 jujutsu sorcerer, and we fans got front row seats as we witnessed Kusakabe hold his own and get in a few good shots against the King of Curses. Chapter 254 closed with Wiwi, the prepubescent curse user with the power to teleport, about to get struck down with one of Sukuna's signature cleaves when he tried escaping the scene with Kusakabe's unconscious body. Body. That is, until a totally unexpected character swooped in and rescued the kid in the nick of time. Well, Jujutsu Kaisen Chapter 255 immediately gives us some of that sweet payoff, as we see that not only was Miguel able to rescue Wiwi, but he even managed to take the beaten Kusakabe's body with him. Even more, Miguel isn't alone. He is accompanied by LaRue, another formidable curse user who used to be one of the original Suguru Ghetto's generals during the night parade of a hundred demons way back in the pages of Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. Sukuna instantly realizes that Miguel isn't alone, and the chapter gives us a flashback on how the Kenyan board curse user ultimately found himself at the heart of Shinjuku. Miguel initially and firmly refused Yuta Okatsu's request to join the battle against the King of Curses, knowing that it's basically a death wish. After all, he was well aware at the time that Sukuna already had a chance of defeating Goju Satoru, the same guy who absolutely schooled him during the night parade of a hundred demons. His companion LaRue is in that room too, and tries to plead Yuta's case by telling Miguel that Sukuna is not going to be at full capacity if they decide to join the fray. All the Jujutsu sorcerers need is a bit of help in finishing off the King of Curses. Still, Miguel's unconvinced. To the former Jujutsu terrorist, even a weakened monster like Sukuna is well above his pay grade. As a side note, LaRue can't help but commend his partner's command of the Japanese language. Yuta, on the other hand, informs Miguel that the whole Sukuna problem isn't just limited to Japan's Jujutsu sorcerers. Should the King of Curses and his allies succeed with their plans, there's no denying that they're going to come for the rest of the world next. Hearing this still seems to do nothing for Miguel. He notes that he'd rather stay within his homeland and protect its borders and rush headlong toward the battlefield. Akutami Sensei even gives us a bit of tongue-in-cheek commentary about how popular media portrays black people. Miguel then tells Yuta that if they want him to join their cause so badly, Gojo should be on his knees begging in front of him. Always the dutiful Jujutsu sorcerer, Yuta and Sen offers to kowtow before him if that will bring him to their side. LaRue steps in on the conversation before things could heat up. He tells Yuta he'd like a word with Miguel alone, and the two former Jujutsu terrorists start to discuss their options. LaRue and his partner agree that they initially got themselves involved with Japan's Jujutsu sorcerers because of Suguru Ghetto, as they truly wanted him to turn the status quo over its head back then. Miguel tells LaRue that he doesn't owe the Jujutsu sorcerers anything anymore, especially now that his deal with Gojo, to train Yuta, has been fulfilled. However, LaRue successfully sways him when he mentions how each and every one of OG Ghetto's generals love of the man. And considering how Kenjaku body snatched and basically desecrated Ghetto's corpse, LaRue thinks that joining the Jujutsu Sorcerer's cause would be akin to a proper send-off to the leader they once loved. Miguel finally makes a decision. He agrees to take up arms against the King of Curses and his crew, but with a couple of caveats. One, he's only going to enter the battlefield after Gojo and Yuta have sufficiently weakened the ancient curse user. And two, LaRue's going to be there with him. Miguel's partner is taken aback when he hears that, to which the Kenyan curse user replies, the more friends, the better. Back in the present, in the middle of Shinjuku's now ruined cityscape, Miguel and LaRue stand some distance away from Sukuna. They notice that the King of Curses domain has been sealed, rendering him unable to use it. Plus, LaRue notices that aside from being significantly weakened, Sukuna's lower left arm has been severed, and the one on the lower right is currently out of commission. 
But what hypes them up and maybe even gives them hope is how they notice that Sukuna's heart hasn't completely healed yet. Miguel feels good about their odds and they go on the offensive. LaRue drops down in front of Sukuna, who promptly lunges at the new challenger. The former ghetto general activates his curse technique, summoning a gigantic hand that grabs the King of Curses and slams him into a wall as if it were a scene from Kung Fu Hustle. The King of Curses easily recovers and counters with his signature cleave technique, slicing through LaRue's gigantic hand before rushing in and barraging him. LaRue sees a gash on his hand similar to the one his technique received from Sukuna, and he dashes away before the King of Curses could pepper him with more invisible slashes. Miguel wastes no time and starts to attack too, spinning and flipping his way around Sukuna's signature technique. The brutal ancient curse user sees LaRue a short distance away, so he launches a large piece of concrete toward his way. Miguel's partner barely has time to react, but he successfully uses his giant hand to grab him by the leg and dodge the incoming projectile. It's then revealed that LaRue's curse technique is called Heart Catch, which has the ability to grab a hold of his opponent's curse techniques. Plus, the giant hand can be resummoned indefinitely if destroyed, with LaRue only taking a tenth of the damage inflicted on it. This explains how he only got a shallow gash on his hand after Sukuna cleaved LaRue's technique earlier. Sukuna thinks that LaRue's ability isn't anything special, but he can see that there's some potential with Miguel. We then get the lowdown on the Kenyan curse user's technique, which is called Hakuna Lana. Basically, Miguel has a two-pronged curse technique that allows him to expel curses while increasing his physical prowess. It's even revealed in a flashback that Gojo knew about this just by looking at him. The late special grade sorcerer even told Miguel that under other circumstances, Hakuna Lana wouldn't be such a threat. And in a stroke of rather self-aware meta storytelling, Akutami Sensei makes Gojo sound, well, a bit racist by implying Miguel's blackness is what makes his curse technique such a formidable ability. Miguel takes offense to this, of course, telling the white-haired jujutsu sorcerer that that's racist, to which Gojo apologizes for the remark. Miguel tells him his race has nothing to do with it. He's special because he's Miguel. Yuta asks Gojo if Miguel could actually beat him, and in another one of those rare instances where the most powerful jujutsu sorcerer of the modern era sets aside his pride, he tells Yuta that Miguel can easily overpower him in a quick fight exclusively using cursed energy enhancements without any domain expansions or cursed techniques involved. In the present, Sukuna is shocked with Miguel's agility as the Kenyan curse user deals him a devastating body shot that lands on his heart after some masterful wrist control. And right then and there, Sukuna notices a figure waiting some distance away with his hands clasped together. It's Chozo, who launches his signature piercing blood technique right at the King of Curses. Sukuna evades the blood arrow by the skin of his teeth and counters Chozo with a couple of cleaves, which forces the cursed womb death painting to go on the defensive. But the King of Curses wouldn't be able to follow up on that, as none other than Yuji returns to the fray and descends upon him with a bone-shattering double hammer fist to the face. Sukuna blocks Yuji with his remaining arms and is slightly surprised that he still has the energy to continue. At this point, it's revealed that Sukuna's ability to use the world bisecting dismantle has been significantly ganked. For one, he needs to activate it with hand signs, which he can't do right now, because his remaining arms are occupied with fending off the Jujutsu Sorcerers, while the other two have been severely damaged. To complicate things further for the King of Curses, he barely notices it when another one of his hands gets sliced off clean, as Maki's in and re-enters the battlefield. Even Sukuna's shocked to find the girl still standing after eating a black flash a few chapters ago. Yuji notices that Sukuna can't activate his world bisecting dismantle, nor can he use reverse cursed energy to heal his injuries in his current condition, which makes the Jujutsu High Freshman think that this might be what will put an L on Sukuna's spotless record. But as Yuji rushes towards the King of Curses, Sukuna activates another black flash and strikes LaRue in the midsection with a solid right straight. And we're left with a cliffhanger, as the narrator tells us that Gojo diverted his reverse cursed energy to use black flash during his bout with Sukuna, but the King of Curses is another case entirely. Our thoughts and theories about Jujutsu Kaisen Chapter 255. In a word, all we'll say about Jujutsu Kaisen's latest chapter is a resounding finally. As we've told you guys earlier, the recent chapters of Gege Akutami's hit manga series stalled its plot like a jalopy in the middle of a freeway, so you wouldn't believe how elated we were to find out how he's gotten the story going again. This installment of JJK gives us fans a much clearer idea of where we are with Sukuna's power levels, as Miguel and LaRue give their assessment. The King of Curses is indeed significantly weakened at this point. It's also nice, albeit a bit uncomfortable, that Akutami Sensei addresses black people's portrayal in manga and anime at large here, by way of portraying Gojo as an initially prejudiced, though ultimately apologetic stand-in for how Japanese popular media usually views black people. And even better, Akutami portrays Miguel in a relatively more fleshed-out manner rather Rather than, say, a stereotypical character like Killer B from Naruto or, God forbid, Mr. Popo from Dragon Ball Z. That aside, there is the mouth-watering cliffhanger from this chapter that more or less implies
implies that Sukuna is hiding an as yet unseen technique under one of her sleeves, or at the very least, he's found another way to up his game. Remember, he came up with the world bisecting dismantle on the fly during his battle with Gojo, so who's to say he hasn't made any new adjustments to turn things in his favor again? Speaking of the world bisecting dismantle, nearly all signs indicate that the King of Curses is gearing up to prepare this devastating technique. It's mentioned in this chapter that Gojo diverted his cursed energy from healing himself and towards unleashing Black Flash before, but Sukuna's case is different. The question is, how different is it going to be? Now, take this with a grain of salt, but we think that it's either Sukuna has found a way to use Black Flash and his reverse cursed energy manipulation simultaneously at this point, and we think it's maybe because he's finally found a way to tap into Megumi Fushiguro's cursed energy. Remember, Megumi's still in there with him. The boy just doesn't want to break free from Sukuna's hold. Plus, Yuriyumi did mention a few chapters ago that Sukuna still wasn't giving in his all throughout his many face-offs with the Jujutsu Sorcerers, so there's some foreshadowing right there. Then again, it's not like this is the first time we've heard characters from JJK blow words out of their butt. You know, like how Gojo told Yuji he'd win against Sukuna in the earlier installments of the series, and we all know how that turned out. In any case, we're just glad JJK's plot started moving again, and we can't wait for the next chapter to come out. What did you think about Jujutsu Kaisen Chapter 255? Got any theories about what Sukuna might be planning? Let's talk about it in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to be the first to see our videos. We'll see you in the next one.